Pete Anderson, how you doing, brother? I think the last time I saw you in person was either at the Guitar Center stumbling around or at a sound check at the Arsenio Hall show. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but yeah, it's been a while, man. I remember we used to chat all the time when we were doing the Rivera Guitar Amp thing. Yeah. And I brought you an amp to Arsenio, and we also talked about voicings and, you know, the systems and then the gain structure of the tubes and all <laughs> the stuff we were going to do with Paul. And of course, Paul and Jack Sonny, I always spoke very highly of you. And I don't think you and I have ever really sat down and had a drink together or anything. But I mean, I feel like I know you because we've talked a million times. You know, yeah. a bunch of the people I know. We're all on the scene at the same time. Yeah. And it's just like, thank you so much for coming on this show. This is just our way of getting our little wares and our little road stories and horror stories. And we just kind of share them with the younger musicians coming up. They have the old gurus passing on the baton. To them. <laughs> you know, right off the bat, I noticed that you were from detroit is that right yes oh my god my wife is from detroit now i don't know if you remember a black female dj named martha jean the queen i sent you a message about that you okay might, you might have forgot or i made a post i probably forgot i made a post on facebook because you posted that and i went oh my god because as i, I was in my late teens early 20s Martha Jean, I was the soul station. Yeah. I mean, I remember her playing Born Under a Bad Sign when it was a single. I'm like, damn. I know, I know. And she started in Memphis, believe it or not, on WDIA and, and launched Elvis and all the, the race acts back then, you know. She came all the way up to Detroit after doing that tenure. And then she broke all the Motown acts up there, of course, yep. and uh, on WJLB. And then, of course, eventually got into religion and started her own church and just all kinds <laughs> of stuff. And then I married her daughter and she baptized me. Nice. <laughs> not necessarily in that order, but... <laughs> She was yeah. it, man. I mean, first of all, it's just hard to imagine that I heard Born Under a Bad Sign when it was first released. Because we look at these are like the scriptures or like the tablets. I know. Look at those records. And she was the number one DJ in Detroit. Detroit was a great music town. And it was such a treasure, even though I was too young to know it was a treasure, to have her as an educated musicologist, which right. she was, giving us music over the radio, over the AM radio. Yep. So yeah, that's just amazing. I, I heard Muddy Waters the first time on that station. Yep. First time in my life. Well, that's because she grew up with all those guys. They all came through Memphis, and she was spinning records in 1954. So you can imagine the stuff she was spinning. Unbelievable. Those people were already established artists thanks to WDIA in Memphis doing that and launching that. Because as you know, WDIA was the very first station in America to allow black programming with black DJs. And they... Yeah played their own music. They played the race music that they loved, you know, believe and they mixed it with gospel. And they even had, believe it or not, some mountain and hillbilly music coming down from the Appalachians on yeah. that station. Yeah. And it all kind of blended together. And of course, Reverend C.L. Patterson was doing his gospel stuff in town. And then that kind of leaked in. And then, then you had Dorsey and Johnny Burnett, you know, doing the rockabilly thing. And it all came together in the middle. And it was, yeah. it was really quite a, a thing. And this is way before Muscle Shoals, I might add. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's awesome. If she eventually bought a radio station called WQBH AM 1400 in Detroit, and that was the, a record breaker for her. It was the first black female to ever own her own standalone radio oh, station. I didn't want to take a lot of time with that, but I just saw that and I wanted to talk about Detroit. So then what, when did you come out to California? So real quickly, my mom and dad both worked for the auto industry, but everybody worked for the auto industry. We were classic from the 50s when the healthy middle class was, was alive and neither of them had a high school diploma, but we had a house. We got two weeks vacation. We had paid medical. They were both in the union. Sort of was like the golden era in America. And when I got to be, my father passed away when I was five. I had no brothers and sisters. Oh. So my mom... She worked at Chrysler's for 30 plus years. Tough ass woman. I mean, just wow. tough. She carried a bag around later on in life when she was out in California and said, the best man for the job is a woman. I got to be uh, out of high school and I said, mom, is there places where it doesn't snow in the winter? And she goes, yes. I said, where? She goes, Florida and California. I said, I'm going there. <laughs> I started on this trek to get the hell out of Detroit. Wow. And there was a thing called driveaway cars. Uh, people that wanted to say they lived in Detroit and they wanted their Grand Prix to go to Phoenix 
and they wanted to bring it to Phoenix without putting it on a travel trailer, they'd hire a couple knucklehead kids like me, my buddy, give us a gas allowance and we would drive it to Phoenix and we, they'd give us three days to drive it. So driveway cars were a big way to get out of town. So my mother retired from the auto industry and she moved to Phoenix. She's just a maverick. She went, I'm going there. I was like, okay. Um, wow. She grew up in southeastern Colorado, so she had this thing oh. about the West. And so I started going in the winter time. I get a driveway car, and I went to Phoenix. I went to a jam session. Then I got a little band together. I turned 21 in Phoenix. Wow. So in Michigan, I was playing in garage bands and churches and blues bands and basement bands and duffing around with my buddies but we weren't old enough to play in bars yet i started playing in bars in phoenix we started in 68 by 72 and this is funny but i felt that i'd ran out of room in phoenix so i'm gonna go to los angeles because it's the next biggest city so me and a bass player came to los angeles in the in may of 72 he had a volkswagen bus we slept in the bus uh, parked on the street, got woke up by the cops every single morning. I eventually I said, give me all your money. Give me all the money in your pocket. I'm getting us a hotel. We found an apartment and I started literally from scratch in Los Angeles, going to jam sessions, hooking up with people, talking to people, hanging out at the guitar stores, playing music whenever and wherever I could. But I just was on the street, man, just trying to learn how to play. That was 1972, three? 72, 73, 74. Same as me. I came here in 73 and started yeah. going forward. We were on the scene at the same time, man. You remember Betten and Music? No, but I worked for Wallach Splevin's Music. Yeah, okay. Well, Betten and Music was a little house on Larchmont near uh, SIR, where SIR used to be, Paramount Studios, Melrose and, and Vine. And there was a guy named Saul Betten who was a sax player, not a very good one, but he loved saxophone, son of a pawnbroker, oddly enough, came from Utah, ended up in Los Angeles, and he started off by brokering horns. And as we know, you and I, just like there's 57 strats, there are certain saxophones that are like sunburst strats. So he would collect these horns. And then as a byproduct of that business, he ended up with a guy working for him named Chris Bristol. Chris Bristol ended up being at Roland US. And the only guy Chris answered to spoke Japanese. He was the second guy in command of Roland. It was the beginning of like Norm's rare guitars. And right. you got to have this screw and this pickup and this pick guard. And this was this, you know, and it wasn't that far removed from vintage you know, Nirvana guitars, like 60s right. and uh, right. late 50s. So they were all floating around. So Chris started his electric business. He was selling electric guitars, vintage stuff, and Saul did the horns. So I'd see like Bud Shank and Art Pepper and all these cats would come in, he'd go in the room and he'd show them altos and tenors and they'd go in and blow. And then on the outside of that room was the kids, basically. And we were all looking at, you know, like, 51 P bases and sunburst strats and black guard tellies and stop tail piece 335, you know, the whole nine yards. So I got a job there in the late seventies and that was a good learning experience for me. And that's when I found out about Howard Roberts' GIT, Guitar Institute of Technology. Prior to GIT, he was doing seminars. So he would travel around the United States and he would do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday seminar. I was a good blues player. I played blues harp, slide, delta, all the way from Robert Johnson, field hollers up to Bobby Bland. That was my world. I knew that stuff. And I wanted to play music. I didn't want to just play blues. I wanted to play music. So the older cats would come in and like Louis Shelton came in there. It was a monster. Yep. And they would come in and Saul would hear them and he'd go, hey, let's play a tune together. And they'd play these songs and I'm like, how do you know these songs? How do you, how can you, and they'd be T for two, and two for T, and they play all these tunes, you know, and, and some of them they didn't know. And I would go, how do they know, the, how do they hear these songs? It was such a mystery to me because I was an illiterate blues player. When I played a major scale, it had a dominant seven in it. Right. I, I, a major seven sounded so wrong to me. So I went on a quest to learn and I took a couple lessons from some reputable guys and that didn't work out. And then the seminar came around and I went to the seminar and it was mind blowing for me. Howard taught the seminar. And as you know, being a guitar player, Howard Roberts was a monster guitar player. Played blues, jazz, bebop, country. He'd play with the wrecking crew during the day. And then at night, 
He'd go down to the art museum and play chamber music. He could read anything. He was a monster. Yeah. Whether you like how he interpreted music or not is not the point because he made some wacky jazz records. But as an educator, he was a complete and utter genius. He had created a curriculum that was genius. You know, uh, Jaybird Coder no. lived up in Oregon. He, he, he took lessons from Howard near the end of his life and ended yeah. up managing his estate when he passed. But yeah, he all, all used to tell me about it is that, you know, the reason why I'm the way I am, he plays for Gina Vanelli now, by the way. Wow. But he basically said it was Howard is who gave me my hands on my fingers. Howard was a genius. He was a complete genius as an educator. It was like back in the day when one of your buddies would get caught up in a Christian group, baptize him over the weekend, call you up and you go, Kenny, you go, yeah, go listen, dude, I got to tell you something. What? Well, I got baptized over the weekend and I can't hang out with you anymore because you'd smoke weed and I'm going to dump all my dope in the toilet. And you'd go, what? Anyway, it was that kind of thing. When I got out of Howard Roberts seminar, I was like, sprung. I went back to work to the little guitar store. My friend, Bob Gross, a great bass player, came up to me and he was being a wise guy. And he goes, hey, you went to that seminar, huh? And I went, yeah, man, I did. And he said, well, what did you learn? And I said, Bob, I know everything there is to know about music. And he goes, bullshit. And I go, ask me. And I had these five little pamphlets that they gave us with about 10 sheets in each one. Howard broke down the whole thing. And he broke it down specifically for guitar. What do you want to know? There's four diminished chords. There's four augmented chords. So it was sort of like, if I explain it, like if I went to see a master carpenter, give me all the tools. And he said, these are the tools that we have. See this tool and this tool, you don't need them. You're never, you're not going to need them. This tool, this is what this does. This is what this, does. I knew what every tool did and how it was used. Could I apply them instantly? No, but I knew what they were and it, he explained music to me. It was life-changing, really. And then I tried to learn on my own off the pamphlets, and I struggled for about a year. And then I heard a rumor, they're starting a school. Every six months, they would start a school. So I missed the first six months, and I went down the next six months and said, here, 2500 bucks. here it is. I want to go to the school. And I went to school with Jennifer Batten, and uh, she was in my class, a young girl, and um, Stan Lynch, who was in Autograph. And Kevin Dukes, who played for Henley. And I mean, my class was pretty prestigious. A lot of guys went on to do really cool stuff. I was older then. I was playing gigs. I was playing honky tonks. And so Thursday night at the shithole bar, I was playing Silver Wings in thirds, you know, like doo -doo 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 practicing on my gig. But um, it changed everything for me, everything, because it made me literate. So do you still have those pamphlets? Yes. So do you think you could maybe translate them into your own Pete Anderson language and show them with young men? Well, I'm not inclined to be so much a guitar educator. I don't mind talking in groups about it. And I'm sure you've done seminars. You know, in seminars, they're like, what's Steve Miller like? Yeah, no, I know. Play that lick. <laughs> I think I was talking more about, uh, you know, like paper, like literary. Yeah, Kevin told you I wrote a book called How to Produce a Record. So that's my oh, tutorial that. where I broke it all down. I talk about my guitar playing and my concept for guitar based in Howard Roberts. I wrote an article for Guitar World. You and I, guitar players, and I don't know if you ever had this, but I always like, I want to write a, a monthly thing in guitar player. Remember how everybody would write something? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had Thompson had me doing some stuff. Right. So it was like I had this wish, like, I want to write an article. So Guitar World called up. They said, you want to do an article every month? And I was like, yeah. And I thought it was really cool. Well, anyway, it turned out to be like homework. The night before, he's going, you need 500 words. They're waiting for you. you better get on. Like, oh, God. But anyway, I wrote this premise called Familiar Licks, Unfamiliar Places. Okay. And what years were that? 20 years ago. Okay, so quite a while ago. So if people wanted to archive that, it might be a little difficult. They look Pete Anderson, Guitar World, they'll find it. Okay, all right. Yeah. And Howard would do things like, he would play a pattern. He'd go, here's this pattern. It's, I call it the X pattern. You go, okay. And you go, no, 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 no. And you go, okay, play it here, and I'll play it here. And he goes, you know why I play that? And we'd go, no. And he goes, because it sounds cool. And you're like, wow. Yep. So he wouldn't burden you with music speak. He right. would not burden you. Because as guitar players, we are pattern players. We look at a grid. He drew the he drew the guitar out with strings. Uh -huh. and it's a grid. So why not play patterns? So I got on this search a while ago, quite a while ago, more than 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, about how do I play outside? Like a great outside player would be like Robin Ford. 
like Robin will play blues and then he'll go and he'll blow a diminished. He'll blow some kind of whole tone, you know, right. lick. Right. And you go, well, that's so yep. cool. And it worked, but he's playing blues. Right. And, I, and there's other players like that. But how do I get outside as Pete Anderson? Because if you get outside as Robin Ford, you sound like Robin Ford and you're not going to sound as good. So you're, you're kind of exposed. So I started a study on how do I get outside and it's putting familiar licks in unfamiliar places. Well, that's why we do guitar education because we're sharing our gift and our skill sets, which really are not of our own. I mean, we just have this when we're born, it just comes. Some guys can work really hard and practice and practice. They'll never have that gift, but yeah. you know, we need to share what we've learned just so we can pass them along for the next generation. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm totally into that. And that's a big part of why I wrote the How to Produce a Record book, because I'd done so many interviews about it. And in the course of these interviews, I sort of realized there was a pattern. Now we uh, we took you up to where you were getting a lot of education. You told your bass player friend that you like got your arms around it finally and you felt real comfortable. Right. Where did you go from there? How did you get into starting to produce? Producing for me was a part of my personality. As a kid, I was a leader. On the playground, I was a leader. In the classroom, I was embarrassed to be a leader. I didn't want to be a leader in the classroom, but I had no problem on the playground organizing. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Let's get over here. We're going to jump over. They're going to climb up. All right, Pete what, Pete, what should we do? And there's kids that acquiesce to you because you got the idea. I had no problem being a leader. And then I went to a Catholic school and the nuns realized that I had leadership skills. This one nun came to me and she created a program with some other students that respected her and said, I want you to nominate Pete for president of the class. I did not want to be president of the class. I did not want any part of it. Anyway, so I got elected president of the class and I had to do all these duties. And it was like, I took it like a job. And I think it was kind of like my mom did a job. I did a job. But then this nun came to me and she said, there's this boy, his name was John Thomas. She said, the other kids don't like him. He lives with his father. He doesn't have a mother. His dad's a mechanic. He lives a rough life because the kids follow you. I want you to go out of your way to include John Thomas in everything you do out there. Okay. And when the nun asks you, you do it, right? right. Good little Catholic boy. Yes, sister. So I was shepherding John. It's like picking the teams. I'll take John. He started to blossom and feel better about it. So I took these leadership skills. And then when we were in bands, just like you and I stumbling around the streets, I wasn't the lead singer. I wasn't maybe the writer, although I was creative, but I was always the guy in the rehearsal, like, Hey, can we try this? And Hey, that doesn't sound like it works. And I was the guy trying to arrange the music and, and organizing it in rehearsals. And as you know, before you have any credentials, if I'm telling you what to do, you're going to go, well, well don't tell me what to do. I, I'm playing this and you, pl you play what you want to play. That's when you're kids, right? Remember trying to tell a drummer to do anything when you weren't the producer or the arranger? Be like, fuck you. I do what I want to do. I was an arranger, unbeknownst to me. I, I realized nobody likes somebody who points out bad things but offers no solution. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know I just, what you're talking about. I don't want to hear you bitching about it. Come up with an answer. Don't just tell me what's wrong. Tell me how to fix it. Anyway, so right. I realized I had to have answers. And when I was illiterate musically, I was just going off the seat of my pants. And although I was listening to records constantly, almost like a curriculum, till I went to GIT, I had no credibility to be a producer because mm. I was illiterate. So GIT gave me, oh, it's on the end of two. Oh, no, it's this. Oh, th you're playing the wrong chord. It's this chord. Oh, I want you to, you know, I could, I could write it out back in the day if I had to write right. out the chord chart, write out the lead, whatever I needed. GIT gave that to me. And yeah. then, as you know, when you get into a room of guys and you challenge somebody, if you don't have the answer, sometimes they're offended and they're just going to buck up against you and go, no, I don't want to do that. Or, um, and what they're afraid of, because I've been in this seat too, is somebody asks you to do something and you can't do it right on the, right on the spot. And you're like, I got to go home and practice it. But you don't, it's embarrassing because it's like, play this lick. And you're like, dun, 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 what is it? Dun, 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 dun. I mean, we still go through it. So consequently, GIT gave me that. And then I started working with songwriters and doing demos because LA is full of songwriter demo guys trying to get a deal. And they would acquiesce only by my talent as a guitar player. And the added factor was not that this was the rumor, but you hired Pete. He's going to bring in some arranging skills and some other things. 
unbeknownst to the guy that hired me. He was just hiring me because he liked how I played guitar. That's how I started. And then, you know, you start in the garage with your buddies and then you start in a band and then, then you go to the demo sessions and then people are a little bit more professional. And then, the, then there's some money involved and people get a little bit more professional. And so I got to that point where I was scuffling around, producing a few things, did my own project with some really good players who believed in me and said, yes, I'll do what you ask me to do. And that was a big plus. I got to work with Norman Petty, who produced all the Buddy Holly records. I was in a country wow. band. And the, and the guy was an older man who knew Norman Petty. And he goes, we're going to drive to New Mexico and do a record with Norman Petty. And I was like, what? And I was totally into it. Right. But we did. And I got to meet Norman Petty and did a whole album with him as producer and engineer. Yeah. Watching how he did things was a stamp of certification. Like I was thinking that was the way that was done. And then Norman would do it. And I go, oh, that's how they do it. So I was seeing things. Right. Yeah. I did a soul band where I wrote songs with this guy. And they were four guys, like the four tops. They were singers called the, the Gliders. And I did a single with them. We did three songs and they cut me loose and let me do what I wanted to do. And so I was putting my foot in that pond and I loved it. I enjoyed it. And then I hooked up with Dwight and Dwight and I hooked up with like, I need a guitar player and I'm playing honky tonks. And I was like, cool. And I started playing guitar with him and realizing he had great songs. Was that in LA or in Bakersfield? Yes. No, that was in LA, nothing in Bakersfield. So I started playing with Dwight. He had Jerry McGee, the famous Jerry McGee on guitar from the Ventures. He had a falling out with Jerry McGee, needed a guitar player. I had a friend who was a steel player who said, hey, this guy's got some tunes. He's going to play this club. He needs a guitar player. Literally, you know, we did a thousand of those. So I met Dwight, heard his songs, realized that he was playing some of his original songs and they were really, really good. They were raw and they weren't arranged, but they were really good. And that's really how that started. And then we pared it down to a four piece, me and Dwight, bass and drums. And we just played crappy bars around LA and played mostly his songs. We played the Palomino quite a bit. We played Brian's Roundup, which is now Cowboy Palace. The funny thing is, is that we played all these clubs. And if it was a two night gig, we were fired. We've got fired from every gig. It was two nights. We did one. If it was four nights, we did two. If it was three nights. We did one. We did two. We did one and a half, whatever. And it was because we wouldn't play popular songs. We would play Dwight stuff. Then we play a little bit of Merle, a little bit of Bill Monroe, revved up. We just did mostly originals and his stuff. And it was the original band that's on guitars Cadillacs, which is double platinum. So we're in these clubs playing me, Jeff Donovan, JD Foster, Brantley Kearns, Dwight, myself, and we're playing Dwight's songs that are on the first record and they're firing us. So long story longer after we get the record deal and everything, and we can talk about that too. But the funny thing was, is that it ended up those songs were on the jute box after we left because we had hits with it. And they were Dwight songs like Guitars, Cadillacs, Honky Tonk Man, stuff like that. And my buddies would call me up and only the ones that were usually drummers because guitar players were going to call me up. They were too jealous. And then my drummer would call me up and go, hey, you're on the jukebox at Brian's Roundup. You made it. They're playing your song. And I, and I know all my guitar player peer group, and they're just pissed. Like, I'm better than him. I should have done that. You know, I, I used to play with Pete. I gave, I let Pete sub on my gigs and it was, you know, one of those things and God bless that I got the opportunity to be that guy. So, but anyway, we got fired from every gig with the original band. Wow. Every gig. Okay. So then now you guys are moving up. Were you the producer on that record or were you just yes. the player? I was the producer. My deal was produced and arranged by Pete Anderson, like was, Lennon and McCartney. It has to say that. Was it a record label deal? No, we borrowed money. We went in and did an EP. Remember Sasha's? Yeah. Oh, okay. Across the street from Sasha's was a sewing machine shop. Behind the sewing machine shop was a studio. I can't remember the name of it. And we got our foot in the door and we did an EP there. I think it was called Excalibur. I can't remember. We borrowed money, made it six song EP, and it had Honky Tonk Man on it. All Dwight songs except for Ring of Fire and Honky Tonk Man. And then when we got the record deal, we did uh, Guitars Cadillacs. Now, how did you get that deal? The EP came out. I knew this guy in Hollywood named Tab Rex. Tab Rex had a record pressing plant next door to Nadine's. I had made some cassettes there with artwork of a band that I had. And okay. I, so I knew the guy. So right. I went into him and I said, hey, I'm playing with this guy, Dwight Yoakam. 
after we got fired from all those bars, we said, fuck it, we're just going to do showcases. Right. So we lied our way into the lingerie and told him we were cowpunk. <laughs> He's like, we're only booking cowpunk. And he goes, we're cowpunk. And that's when all the kids were trying to play country music, but they weren't very good at it. And we were like seasoned collectively. We had a hundred years on the bandstand. So right. we'd go in there and hammer them. And, you know, it's Dwight Yoakam. He sings like monster singer. We'd go in there and play country music, but just turn up. Nobody told us to turn down because right. it's the lingerie. And we just bomb them. And at the same time, Maria McKee and Lone Justice was taken off in lots of press. And we kept buddying up with them, like, let's open for Lone, because they were going to get a crowd. So we were like, let's go with, let's go where they're going. And they were the little darlings. We went to the Palomino. So I called this guy, Tab Rex, and I said, would you be interested if I bring you this artist, would you make a record and put it out for us? Just, mm -hmm. It was called, uh, it's called P&D, Promote and Distribute. We had no money. We weren't going to pay him. He was like, he's going to take a chance on it. But yeah, I said, okay. He said, so when can I come see you play? We're playing the Palomino Friday night. Come on down. Okay, I'll come and see you. All right, I'll put your name on the list. Friday night comes. He goes to the Palomino and we're opening for Lone Justice. Well, he's not savvy enough to know that this crowd that's packed out the door is for Lone Justice. <laughs> he thinks it's for us. Uh. <laughs> and he can't get in. He can't get in the club. He's like, oh, my ah, God. Oh. Sorry, there's too many people in here. Well, it probably gave him a great impression. I know. So, <laughs> so the next, so Monday I go, hey, man, I didn't see you at the gig. He goes, I came to the gig. It was so crowded. I couldn't get in. And I didn't say a word. I didn't say, well, it's because no justice is in the Herald Examiner every fucking Let it rub time. off on you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so I go, oh, he goes, yeah, I want to do this. Let's do it. Oh, wow. That's so he great. We had the catalyst was, yeah. of, of, of just, you know, that situation. He's, this is the kind of stuff you can't teach in college and in classes. And stuff. If you listen to this, kids, this is the kind of stuff that makes stars. I'm telling you. It's like, you know, it's, luck of the draw. It's, it's like you overhear over your shoulder at a Denny's at two in the morning. Some guy's talking about how he's looking for a certain song or a certain kind of band. And you go, really? What kind? <laughs> exactly. Like, what, time, what time do we need to be there? You know, it's like. <laughs> That's the kind wrong. of stuff you can't teach. You know, I know. It's crazy. So now he's in like Flint and you guys so got So wait a minute, it gets better. So I go to the guy, he's flipped out. He goes, yeah, I'd love to do this with you guys. That's great. I said, okay, come to find out the girl that ran his office took all the phone calls. She would send all the records like Rodney Bingham, Hell's Come to Your House, Butthole Surfers, all this shit. She had a press list. Her name is Jonette Napolitano. Okay. Jeanette Napolitano became the lead singer for Concrete Blonde. Oh. Yeah, so she was, was, but she was a young girl who wasn't in Concrete Blonde yet. We did a soundtrack together, uh, Pump Up the Volume. I had a song on there with Ivan Neville and she was yeah. with her band on that record. Yeah. So there's that other piece of the puzzle. She had worked at A&M and when she left, she stole their press list. Nice. She took it with her. <laughs> Now we have some espionage going yeah. on. Yeah. <laughs> so she had a list and she was just sending records out. So, oh my God. Now imagine this. This is in the 80s. So, in the 80s, and I, I have a theory about this to some degree, but back when newspapers were healthy, the guys that wrote about music, Robert Hilburn, this guy, that guy, whoever, whoever, yeah. that, at the newspapers were all musicologists. They all loved music, they had record collections, they could talk about music. And so you can imagine that, say, whoever the best music guy is in Chicago gets his box of records from Tab Rex, and he opens the box to review these records, and he sees butthole surfers. Fuck that. He sees, like, you know, hell comes to your house, Bob. Fuck that. This one, uh, worms ate my brains. Fuck that. Then he goes, country record. And what year is this? 83 oh so this is like right when new wave it had been hitting for a while yeah, yeah so just put yourself in his place you're an educated guy so you like how many times do you get this box of alternative records from los angeles where there's a country record there was no alternative country records sugar hill and rounder put them out but that was it so it perked their interest right and then purposefully i told dwight we needed when we put ring of fire I said, we got to put a song on the record that you didn't write that everybody knows. He's like, why? And I said, because when I go into a record store and I look through the record bin back in the day and I see something new and I look at it 
if I don't recognize one of the songs, there's a chance I might not want to buy that record. But if I go, oh, this looks interesting. Oh, and they did Ring of Fire or they did a blues tune, something I knew. I want to buy it to hear how they did that song. That's going to open a door. So we did Ring of Fire. So everybody would listen to Ring of Fire first. It was good. And the press blew up. Right. It blew up. We had no publicist. It just was wildfire. Right. And uh, a girl that worked at Warner Brothers for Jim Ed Norman in Nashville named Paige Rowden at the time. Her name is Paige Levy. Paige latched onto this record and she championed it. And eventually we got signed to a deal with Warner Nashville. Wow. Now, Ring of Fire, that's a Johnny Cash tune. Yeah. Yeah. I went down, down, down in a burning ring. Yeah, I'm just giving that to some of the younger people out yep. there who may not recognize yep. the title. <laughs> they yep. might say it was Springsteen. You know, yeah, you know. right. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. he had a song called I'm on Fire. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. So now you're kind of like a new wave punk country act. We were cowpunk. We just, we said we were cowpunk. Right. But you really weren't, but you just no. became it by way of osmosis. <laughs> we were sort of like the Burnett brothers. You know, we were right. revved up, played a little bit distorted. Honky yeah. Tonk could play, you know, sit up there and play under the double eagle and Bob Wills and then turn around and play Elvis. And, you know, we could do it all. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Good man. So how many records did you do with Dwight? I did every record from whatever that was, 84 to 2002. So all the Warner Brothers records mm -hmm. and one record for Koch Audium. And I don't how many? I don't know a lot. And were you able to produce all of them? I produced all of them. I wow. wouldn't do it if I wasn't producing. Wow, that's fantastic. That was my ticket. Well, that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that's a, something to teach the kids out there, too. So, you know, just don't be a side man. You know, come forward. And uh, if you're a leader and you're coming up with ideas and arrangements like you were doing in your musical taste, you got to stand up and demand what you're yeah. doing. There was crossroads there that I was not willing to cross. It was just like, nope, God bless you. Do your thing. I'll, I'll say goodbye. Right. Either this way or we don't do it. Right. Yeah. So you stick by what you got. You There's other things. Michelle shocked here. I got, uh, uh, you know, I've got Lucinda Williams. I got Buck on here. I got Roy Orbison. Uh, were you involved in any of those records in terms of player or producer? I produced all of them. Okay. That's what Everything's, I thought. Everything really based from production. In the early days, a lot of it, I played the guitar. And then, of course, if they had a guitar player, um, I did. I would be very supportive. I didn't want to be intimidating and I would never play in front of them and I wouldn't take the guitar out of their hands. I would say, play this, try that. Um, I was very aware of that. You're like Daniel Lenoir. You, you come in and play the guitar parts, but he let the edge do his thing. <laughs> yeah, it's all really based on arrangement. Mm -hmm. And production was common sense following the arrangements. Mm -hmm. For me, I'm a musician producer. I'm not an engineer producer. Right. And I'm not a musicologist producer, although I am somewhat of a musicologist because I've listened to so much music. Right. But you and I are the same. We know what it's like to sit out on the floor with headphones on and deliver a part under fire. And if I'm producing you, I know what you're going through. Yeah. So I'm going to make it as comfortable as possible for you. That's great, man. Well, yeah. anybody out there who want a great producer, Pete's still in town. <laughs> He's still breathing. He's still getting up and having nourishment in the morning. Look at him. Yeah. <laughs> Still got it going a little bit. <laughs> well, thanks for coming to the Miramonte Man Cave. Nice. I love right. it. And uh, from fretfriends.com, we just thank you for uh, all two. Yeah. And say yeah. hi to your wife and thank her for her mom. Oh, I will. <laughs> thanks for being a fan of my mother-in-law. Yeah, man. <laughs> all right, brother. Rest in peace, Martha Jean. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning into this episode with Pete Anderson, the great guitar player producer who hailed from Detroit, where my wife is from. I couldn't believe that he knew who my mother-in-law was. That was fantastic. But what an incredible journey, him coming up in Hollywood, just being a honky-tonk player and then getting the education that he needed by going to GIT and learning theory and learning. So, for those of you that would like to take lessons on my Fret Friends website, just go to fretfrenz.com and you can look at the sample lesson I have there. There's also a free trial for 24 hours. Also, if you like this video you heard here on my YouTube channel, please subscribe to it and also like it. Thanks a lot for tuning in to Fret Friends Play and Tell series, and we'll see you on the next one.